Hello, this is Akram Jafar, and in this video I'm going to present some picture tests and practical anatomy of the lower limb. This video deals with the knee and popliteal fossa. You may use the video as a revision or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, pause the video and spend some time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Which artery is palpated here? This is the region of the popliteal fossa, which is located behind the knee joint, and the artery is the popliteal artery that is being palpated. As you can see here that the knee is flexed because the popliteal fossa has a very thick fascial covering, popliteal fascia, and in order to release tension on this fascia, then the knee should be flexed. This is one reason. And the second reason is that the artery is very deep within the fossa. The neurovascular bundle in the fossa is formed by the popliteal artery, popliteal vein, and the tibial nerve from the front backwards. So the deepest structure in the fossa is the popliteal artery. That's why the pulsations of the artery can only be felt by deep palpation, and the artery is compressed against the tibia. Which of the structures 1 to 5 is most likely injured when the stance knee sustains a twisting injury by a hit from the lateral side? First, let's identify the ligaments. One is on the lateral side because this is the fibula. So it is the lateral collateral ligament or the lateral fibular ligament. It extends between the femur and the head of the fibula. Second is a meniscus, the fibrocartilage that is present in the knee joint. This is the lateral meniscus. And then four is the uh, cruciate ligament. It is the posterior cruciate ligament that is attached to the posterior aspect of the tibial plateaus and passes forwards and medially to be attached to the inside of the medial condyle of the femur. This is the medial meniscus, it is unlabeled here. And then five is the medial collateral ligament or the tibial collateral ligament that extends between the femur and the upper part of the medial surface of the tibia. Three is an interosseous membrane, which is located between the tibia and the fibula. It has nothing to do with the knee joint and so is not affected by the injury of the knee joint. A hit from the lateral side is the common scenario of injury in contact sports. In a stance knee, the tibia and fibula are fixed on the ground, and so a hit from the lateral side will result in abduction of the femur. This abdu abduction results in stretching and rupture of the medial collateral ligament. So the medial collateral ligament is most likely to be torn. This type of injury might not only result in the injury of the collateral ligament, but injury of other structures, also starting with the letter C. So three Cs are affected. Collateral ligament, and in this case it is the medial collateral ligament. Cruciate ligament, and in this case the anterior cruciate ligament, which is not shown here, and the cartilage or the meniscus. And the meniscus in this case is the medial meniscus, which is attached to the medial collateral ligament. While as you can see here, that the lateral meniscus is separated from the lateral collateral ligament and it can be pushed out of the harm's way by the attachment of the popliteus muscle that passes into the joint and sends some fibers to attach to the lateral meniscus. So the answer for this question is five, the medial collateral ligament. This is an arthroscopic view into a joint. The metal probe sits across a normal appearing ligament. Identify the joint and the ligament. You can see here the condyle of the femur. This is the lateral condyle. Look at the cartilage covering the condyle, the hyaline articular cartilage. And this is the other condyle, the medial condyle. This should be the tibia here. And this is the cruciate ligament, the anterior cruciate ligament. This intra capsular ligament. So we can see it inside the joint. It passes from the tibia, anterior aspect of the tibial plateau, to the lateral side. While coming from the posterior side towards the anterior, towards the medial condyle, is the posterior cruciate ligament. And they cross each other like a crust. That's why they are called the cruciate ligament. So this ligament here in front of us is the anterior cruciate ligament. They are called, by the way, they are called anterior and posterior according to their attachment to the tibia, not to their attachment to the femur. So the anterior is attached to the anterior intercondylar area of the tibia, while the posterior cruciate is attached to the posterior intercondylar area of the tibia. How would you describe the patella in the painting? 
called The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Willem Rowell. A closer look here shows us that the patella is in two pieces. This is what we call a bipartite patella. This is a normal variant it's present in approximately 2% of the population and it presents the presence of an accessory ossification center that remains unfused. A bipartite patella is discovered incidentally in asymptomatic individuals and occurs sometimes bilaterally. The important thing to keep in mind is that not to confuse it with a fracture of the patella in a radiograph. Which of the muscles 1 to 5 is attached to the fibula? Now this is a view of the popliteal fossa. You can see the diamond-shaped fossa. The muscles that form the superior boundaries, we have the muscle 1, which is the semitendinosus muscle attached to the upper part of the medial aspect of the tibia. And then number two, deep to it, is the semimembranosus muscle attached to the back of the medial condyle of the tibia. So this is the medial side here. This is the lateral side, and we can see the common tendon of the biceps femoris muscle, which is attached to the fibula. So this is the muscle that's attached to the fibula. Inferior boundaries are formed by the two heads of gastrocnemius. You can see the medial head here. This is the lateral head of gastrocnemius, and both of them are attached to the femur, to the condyles of the femur. And here you can see the accompanying the lateral head of gastrocnemius is the plantaris muscle, also attached to the femur proximally. So it's only number three that is attached to the fibula. In this angiogram, at the region of the knee, identify the artery indicated by the arrow. You can see here the femur, the tibia, intercondylar crest of the tibia. Behind the knee joint is the popliteal artery. Here is the popliteal artery, the continuation of the femoral artery. You can see the multiple genicular branches that form the genicular anastomosis as well as some muscular branches. And then below the knee joint and distal to the attachment of the popliteus muscle, it divides into anterior tibial and posterior tibial arteries. So what is the origin of the artery? Is the continuation of the femoral artery, its terminal branches, the anterior and posterior tibial arteries. Note the close proximity of the popliteal artery to the popliteal surface of the femur. And that's why in supracondylar fractures of the femur, the sharp end of the distal fragment of the femur, which will be pulled posteriorly by the two heads of gastrocnemius, can injure the artery. The knee joint is surrounded by bursae that may or may not communicate with the synovial cavity of the joint. In the following pictures, which bursa is inflamed in each? Let's look at the first one here. Now, you look at A, this is, looks like this outpocketing or outpouching in the back of the popliteal fossa is recurrent. Look at the part of a previous operation. This is a common cystic formation in the popliteal fossa. It's known as Baker's cyst because of the outpouching of the bursa that is related to the medial head of gastrocnemius and semimembranosus muscles. Of course, it should be differentiated from another structure which causes such a swelling, and this is an aneurysm of the popliteal artery, but of course, an aneurysm would, would result in a pulsatile swelling and a brewy, while this is just a herniation of the gastrocnemius or the semimembranosus bursa into the popliteal fossa. It communicates with the synovial joint of the knee, and it should, should also be differentiated from a saphena varix of the small saphena space. B is an inflammation of the prepatellar bursa. This bursa is a subcutaneous bursa. Its full name is the subcutaneous prepatellar bursa. It lies between the skin and the anterior surface of the patella and may be inflamed after prolonged working on the hands and knees. Condition is known as housemaid's knee. It doesn't communicate with the cavity of the knee joint. C is an inflammation of the suprapatellar bursa. This bursa is located above the knee joint between the femur and the tendon of the quadriceps femoris muscle. Actually, it extends about four finger breadth above the patella, above the base of the patella. This is an extension, upward extension, normal upward extension of the cavity of the knee joint. It is held upward by the attachment of few muscle fibers from the vastus intermedius called the articularis geno muscle. So the suprapatellar bursa is in natural continuity with the knee joint. In this X-ray of the distal end of the femur, which muscle is responsible for the backward tilt of the distal fragment as seen in the lateral view? 
This is the backward tilt, and it is produced by the gastrocnemius muscle, attachment of the two heads of gastrocnemius muscle. Which artery is likely affected by the sharp edge of the tilted distal fragment? The artery is the popliteal artery, which is the deepest of the structures in the popliteal fossa and is in close proximity to the popliteal surface of the femur. So the sharp proximal edge of the distal fragment may tear this artery. In such a fracture, then we have to make sure that the popliteal artery is intact by palpating the distal pulsations of the branches of the popliteal artery and these are the dorsalis spedis artery the continuation of the anterior tibial on the dorsum of the foot just lateral to the tendon of extensor hallucis longus or the posterior tibial artery behind the medial malleolus which fibrocartilage is related to the surface one surface one is the articular surface with the tibia of the lateral condyle of the femur and the lateral and medial condyles of the tibia in fact are made a little bit deepened because they are like a plateau they are flat they are deepened by two cartilages fibrocartilages which are called the menisci c-shaped cartilages crescentic cartilages so this surface is related to the lateral meniscus what is attached to area two area two is located on the inside of the lateral condyle of the femur and it is here that the anterior cruciate ligament is attached the posterior cruciate ligament will be attached to the inside of the medial condyle of the femur what articulates with the surface three this is the patella the articulation between the patella and the femur note here that the distal end of the lateral condyle of the femur is more circular than the oval shaped distal end of the medial condyle of the femur and note here that the lateral condyle of the femur is more prominent anteriorly than the medial condyle of the femur in order to prevent lateral dislocation of the patella so by this way we can identify this side of the distal end of the femur without looking at the head of the femur we can identify it as the lateral side while this side is the medial side identify the muscle a list the bone to which it is attached this muscle is a soleus muscle. It is located on the back of the leg in the calf region. Here is the popliteal fossa, and this is the calf. It is called soleus, not because it is located in the sole of the foot, but because its shape looks like a solefish. It is attached to the soleal line on the tibia, and then it's also attached to the fibula. In between these two bones, there is an arch of muscle beneath which passes the neurovascular bundle, as you can see here. Identify the artery B. B is the popliteal artery. It is the continuation of the femoral artery, and it continues to be popliteal until we reach the distal border of the popliteus muscle. Here, this is the popliteus muscle. Its two terminal branches are the anterior and posterior tibial arteries two branches apart from the terminal branches the artery supplies muscular branches which are unnamed but it also supplies genicular branches so they are not clearly shown here but this one probably is a branch this is another branch so this is the lateral genicular and this is the medial genicular lower lateral and lower medial genicular we have upper medial and upper lateral genicular and a middle genicular artery these genicular arteries as the name indicates they participate in the blood supply of the joint and they form an, an arterial anastomosis around the joint identify the vessel with which bone is the vessel closely related during its course in the region this is the popliteal fossa and you can see the structures in the fossa are the deepest structure is the artery popliteal artery then more superficial to it is the popliteal vein and then the more superficial is the tibial nerve the tibial nerve is a branch of the sciatic nerve the other branch you can see it here this is the common peroneal nerve going to the lateral side here is the tendon of biceps femoris muscle these are the tendons of semitendinosus and semimembranosus muscle on the medial side the popliteal artery is closely related to the femur posterior aspect of the femur the region of the femur which is called the popliteal surface of the femur between the two supracondylar lines the nerve the common peroneal nerve will pass laterally and then anteriorly it winds around the neck of the fibula so it's closely related to the neck of the fibula in this region where it is also subcutaneous and can be crushed 
in this region against the bone. Identify the circumscribed structure. Let's identify the x-ray. Here I can see the femur, the femoral condyles here, and this is the tibia. You can see the tibial tuberosity anteriorly, the plateaus of the tibia and the intercondylar eminence. And this is the head of the fibula, styroid process, and the neck of the fibula. And this is the superior tibiofibular joint. This bone here is located posteriorly, not anteriorly. It is not the patella, but it is a sesamoid bone like the patella, much smaller than the patella, and it is not always present. As you can see, it is located within the soft tissue of the calf. In fact, it is located in the tendon of gastrocnemius muscle, and this is the fabella. To be specific, the fabella is present in the lateral head of gastrocnemius, close to the lateral condyle of the femur, and it is present in about 40% of the people, less than 40% of the people. It is a variant bone.